In the Gospels, the main story is the life of Jesus. But within this, there are smaller stories about other people, fishermen and Pharisees and tax collectors and so on. What you're going to see in a few minutes is not a movie on the life of Jesus, but a series of short video clips about these people. Each one will last just a few minutes. People who met Jesus. When we read the Gospels, one of the disciples of Jesus really stands out from all the others. Simon Peter. Peter and his brother Andrew were fishermen on the Lake of Galilee. It was a family business. One day, Peter and Andrew were using a casting net near the shore at Capernaum. Already they knew Jesus of Nazareth. But what he said to them this time was unexpected. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men? What did that mean? But follow me was clear enough, so they did. On Saturday, the Sabbath, they went to the synagogue for prayer and for the reading of scripture. The preacher was Jesus and his words had an authority they had never heard in other teachers. But as he spoke, there was a commotion in the congregation. It was a man who was possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He started to cry out and shout against Jesus. Let us alone! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come here to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Peter was amazed. What did this mean? Jesus rebuked the spirit. Be quiet and come out of him. The people were confused. What is this, they said. For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Peter was not a Bible scholar like the scribes. He was not a priest. He did not belong to a strict religious group like the Pharisees. But Peter spent time with Jesus, watching his every action, listening even when he didn't quite understand. And gradually, he changed. As Jesus preached and healed the sick, his reputation grew, and he gathered a group of 12 men around him as his disciples. One of them was Peter. Then one day they left Galilee and started to travel north to the region of Caesarea Philippi. Away from the crowds, away from all the activity, Jesus wanted to talk to them. Who do people say that I am? Some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say that you are the prophet Elijah. Some say you are Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets raised from the dead. Jesus ignored all this speculation. But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said, You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Simon, son of Jonah, you have been blessed. For flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father, who is in heaven. Jesus and his disciples went back to Galilee, but he warned them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be killed, and on the third day be raised up. Some time later, they came to Jerusalem. Peter and John went into the city and prepared a room for Jesus to eat the Passover feast with his disciples. Everything had been very carefully planned, but it seemed that Jesus had forgotten something. At a dinner like this, there was normally a servant to wash the feet of the guests, but not tonight. There was a bowl and water and even a towel, but no servant. 
This was a job no one wanted to do. As Peter and the other disciples argued about who should get the best places at the table, Jesus himself started to serve them. He was going to wash their feet. Clearly this was no afterthought. Jesus had planned it this way. Peter was shocked. No, Lord, you wash my feet? Never. Unless I do wash you, said Jesus, you have no part with me. Then not just my feet, Lord, wash my head and my hands too. So Jesus became his servant and washed Peter's feet. That night, Jesus asked Peter with James and John to come with him to an orchard of olive trees to pray. As Jesus prayed, Peter fell asleep. Jesus continued to pray alone. In the end, he came back to Peter and woke him. Simon, Simon, are you asleep? The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is being betrayed. One moment Peter was asleep. The next moment there were torches and lanterns and men with weapons. It was like a bad dream. Everything happened so quickly. Jesus was being arrested. Peter struck out with his sword, but it was no use. Jesus was taken and then it was all over. The next day Jesus was dead. Crucified by the Romans. He was buried by two members of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Jewish Court. Peter had no part in it. The disciples kept out of sight. Then on Sunday morning, some of the women came with news that the tomb was empty and the body of Jesus was gone. Peter and John rushed to the tomb. The women were right about the body. The tomb was empty. The grave clothes were there, and that was all. Everything seemed so confused. Peter and John decided to go back to the others. Nothing seemed to make sense anymore. And then, peace be with you. What was it? A ghost, perhaps? No, it was Jesus, very much alive. Jesus had broken the power of death. It was all too much for Peter to take in, but it was true. As the Father has sent me, said Jesus, I am sending you. Now Peter would become a fisher of men. Instead of getting fish into a net, Peter spent the rest of his life getting people into the kingdom of God. The change in Peter from fisherman to apostle and evangelist did not happen in a day or in a year, but it began with a single moment when Jesus said, follow me, and Peter left his nets and did what Jesus said. Jesus said, if any man will hold on to his life, he will lose it. But if a person lets go of his life for my sake, he will find it. The first book in the New Testament bears his name. Matthew, Levi, son of Alphaeus. He lived in the town of Capernaum by the Lake of Galilee. Matthew was a man who seemed to live in two different worlds. Part of his life was Jewish and religious, though not very strict. The other part of him lived in the world of collecting taxes, 
where different cultures came into contact. It was not the people of Galilee who created these taxes. It was the Roman government. And the men who took this work were regarded as collaborators with a foreign power. And they were hated. One of these collaborators was Matthew. Matthew was a compromiser in religion and in politics. And continually he was in contact with Gentiles coming and going through the town. As a result, all sorts of things passed through his hands. Some of these were regarded as unclean in the Jewish religion. This contact made Matthew unclean in the eyes of his own people. He was contaminated by the Gentiles. The tax collectors were despised by everyone. Even the Romans saw them as a necessary evil and the Jewish people regarded them as thieves who misused their authority to collect far more than was legally required. The whole system was corrupt. So Matthew found himself hated by his own people and still not accepted by the Gentiles. He made enough money, but he lost his self-respect. In the town of Capernaum, Jesus was gathering a group of disciples, Peter the fisherman, James and John, and in a place as small as this, Jesus knew all about the tax collector. And Matthew had seen Jesus many times, but there was never a reason for him to get involved. But this was about to change. What Jesus said to Matthew was not expected by anyone. Follow me. Jesus and his followers were good, loyal Jews. Matthew was despised by his own people. He might be rejected by the disciples. There was another problem. Peter could still use his fishing boat. But for Matthew, there could be no part-time tax collecting. To join the companions of Jesus, Matthew must leave everything. Later that evening, Matthew invited Jesus to his house. Now the problems began. The religious leaders in the town, the scribes and Pharisees, believed that to eat with people like Matthew caused spiritual uncleanness. Why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? Those who are well do not need a doctor, said Jesus, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The call of Matthew to follow Jesus could have split the group of disciples down the middle. It was a risk. But Jesus felt the risk was worth it, and Matthew's life was changed. The tax collector became a disciple. As it turned out, the problem was not with the disciples, but with the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders. Jesus quoted a scripture to them. He said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Sacrifice means the religious ceremonies in the temple, and this involved ritual purity. So for the scribes and Pharisees, religion included staying away from people who might contaminate them. But Jesus could take men and women who were far away from God, sinners, and he could change their hearts and lives. But he could only do this by coming close to them and showing kindness. It makes you think, doesn't it? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, we read about a centurion in the town of Capernaum. 
In the Roman army, a centurion was the commander of a company of men. In theory, a hundred. In practice, usually about 60 to 80 soldiers. The Roman army had a dirty job to do. One time in Galilee, they crucified 2,000 Jewish men. The centurions had a reputation for being tough. The vine stick they carried was not just for decoration, a sword for the enemy and a stick for the backs of their own men. But the centurion in Capernaum was different. He was a good man and had a strong faith in God. He had a servant in his house, a man who had given him many years of loyal and valuable service. But now the servant was very ill, and it was clear that he was dying. The centurion heard of Jesus, how he healed sick people. Perhaps Jesus would come and heal his servant. But the centurion felt he was not worthy even to approach Jesus. He felt his request might sound better coming from the elders of the synagogue. So he asked them to go. Jesus was living in the town of Capernaum at this time, and the elders knew where to find him. They pleaded with Jesus to come at once. This man deserves to have you do this. He loves our nation, and he has built our synagogue. Jesus did not need persuading. I will come and heal him. The centurion was thinking things over. How did Jesus heal the sick? Did he apply medicines to them? No, often he touched them, but sometimes he just spoke to them. Jesus had the authority of God to heal diseases. I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come here, and he comes. I say to my servant, uh, do this, and he does it. Surely it was the same with Jesus. The centurion knew that when Jesus spoke the word, it was enough. The servant would be completely healed. By now, Jesus was not far from the house, but the centurion sent a message to him. Lord, don't trouble yourself. I don't deserve to have you come under my roof, but say the word and my servant will be healed. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and said, I tell you, even in Israel, I have not found such great faith. As his friends came back to the house, they found the servant was completely healed, and the centurion had grasped the meaning of faith. The centurion talked about authority, and Jesus talked about faith. Because faith begins with recognizing the authority of God. How can a person who's kicking and struggling against the will of God possibly have faith in him? Now the centurion knew that all he had done, his generosity to the synagogue, his kindness to his servant and so on, all this and more could not buy God's favor. And yet he believed that Jesus would come just by asking him. Faith is not a coin we put in a vending machine to get what we want from God. It's a relationship between us and God, a relationship that involves trust and obedience. If you don't have this kind of relationship with God, the best place to start is where you are. And the best time is right now. For many centuries, the Middle East has been a place of political and religious conflicts. About 2,000 years ago, one of these problems involved the Jewish nation and the Samaritans. This is the story of one Samaritan woman. It was the middle of the day, and for many people, it was a time to relax. But one woman went down to the well 
and she chose a time when she would be alone. But there was a man at the well, and he was Jewish. Centuries of bitterness had separated their people, and he was not welcome. Perhaps he was thirsty, but according to the Jewish teachers, for a Jew to drink from a cup which was used by a Samaritan would make him unclean. She knew he would not speak to her. And in those days, a man and a woman who were not closely related did not usually make eye contact. But this Jewish man asked for a drink. The woman was shocked. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? The Jews do not use things together with Samaritans. If you knew the gift of God, said Jesus, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, she said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, so where do you get that living water? Whoever drinks of this water will still get thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never get thirsty. It will be inside them a spring of water welling up into everlasting life. Sir, she said, give me this water so that I don't get thirsty and come here to draw from the well. Go, he said, call your husband and come here. But I have no husband. You did right to say, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. You have told the truth. Sir, she said, I can see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, not just on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming, and now it's here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. I know the Messiah will come, and when he comes, he will tell us everything. I who speak to you am he. A Jewish messiah who talked with Samaritans? She had to tell the village about him. Not the military leader some had expected, but a prophet, a teacher, and a savior. The woman's life was changed. And because of her, the people of Samaria invited Jesus to stay with them in their village. She was a victim of history, the history of her people and her own personal history. But Jesus broke through the barriers that had separated their people by his simple request for a drink of water. Above all, he showed her her need of God, of truthfulness, and that he, the Messiah, could change her life as he had changed the lives of others. If you want to read the story, it's in the Gospel of John. Chapter 4. In the Gospel of John, chapter 4, we read about two days in the life of one man, a nobleman who was an official in the court of Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee. In the palace of Herod, the nobleman had power and influence. But today, none of this was important. In the town of Capernaum, his son was seriously ill. As the hours went by, it got worse, and there was nothing they could do. If money could buy life, they would have given everything. But their child was dying. Only Jesus could heal him now and the nobleman knew they could never reach him in time. Jesus had been in Jerusalem for a while, but now he had left Judea and traveled north to Cana, 
a village in the Galilee, not so far away. For the nobleman and his family, this changed everything. But he must come quickly. Jesus had healed many sick people in the towns and villages of the Galilee. And the nobleman knew that if Jesus would come to Capernaum immediately, there was a chance that his child might live. Surely Jesus would come. The nobleman pleaded with him. But Jesus was not in a hurry. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. The nobleman did not understand. Lord, come down, please, before my child dies. Go on your way, said Jesus. Your son lives. Somehow the nobleman knew that as soon as Jesus spoke, his son was healed. It was not necessary for Jesus to come and touch the boy. His word alone had power to heal. Before the nobleman got home, his servants met him. Your son lives! Wonderful news! And when did this happen? asked the nobleman. It was yesterday. At the seventh hour, the fever left him. It was the same hour Jesus had told him, Go on your way. Your son lives. And now the evidence was right in front of his eyes. His son was healed. When the nobleman asked Jesus to come to Capernaum, Jesus said, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. And then he said, Your son will live. It was a challenge. Could the nobleman believe that the word of Jesus was enough, or did he have to watch the miracle happen? The nobleman chose to put his faith in the word of Jesus. His son was healed. And as a result, he himself, his family, his servants, his whole household believed in Jesus. The Bible says he himself believed and all his household. John, in his gospel, calls the miracle a sign. It points to something. It has a meaning. It's this. Jesus did not have to see the boy or even to go near him in order to heal him. Jesus spoke. And it was done, because the word of Jesus is enough. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke, we read about a man named Jairus. He lived in the town of Capernaum, and he came to Jesus with a very special request. This is his story. Jairus was an important man in his community, a ruler of the synagogue. But today that did not mean much to him. For Jairus and his family, only one thing was important. Their 12-year-old daughter was seriously ill, and they knew she was dying. There was only one hope. In the town of Capernaum, Jesus of Nazareth had healed sick people miraculously by the power of God. Jairus went looking for Jesus. My little daughter is dying, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. There was also a woman in Capernaum who suffered from bleeding, not just once a month, but all the time. In Jewish religious law, this made her unclean. Anyone she touched also became unclean, even someone who sat on the same stool. Jesus could heal her. Of that, there was no doubt. But always he was surrounded by crowds, and if the people saw who it was, they would shout at her and drive her away. And Jesus, how could he touch her if she made him unclean? But perhaps she could touch him, just the edge of his cloak. No one would know. 
Jesus felt that power had gone out of him. Who touched me? The disciples objected. Lord, everybody's touching you. I touched you, she said. Daughter, said Jesus, go in peace. Your faith has made you well. For the woman it was wonderful, but for Jairus the delay was serious. At that moment Jairus got the news. His daughter, his little girl, was dead. It was too late. If only they had not stopped for the woman. But Jesus would not be put off. Do not be afraid. Only believe. She will be made well. They must go on. Jesus took three disciples, Peter, James and John. Already the professional mourners were at the house, weeping and wailing. Jesus objected. Make room. Why this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. The professional mourners knew the girl was dead, and the more noise they made, the better they would be paid. They started to laugh at him. Jesus must be out of his mind. Who did he think he was? Jesus ignored them. When Jairus came in, he saw for himself. His daughter was dead. But Jesus spoke to the body as if she could hear him. Talitha kumi. Little girl, I say to you, get up. Jairus had received his miracle. His daughter was alive. And the woman, too, could begin a new life because of Jesus. For Jairus, the most difficult moment was when Jesus stopped to speak to the woman who had been healed of bleeding, while his own daughter was dying. When the woman touched the tassel on the garment worn by Jesus, it was a very important action because in that culture, holding a cord or the edge of a cloak worn by a person of authority placed you under his protection. There was nothing magical in the clothes of Jesus Christ. And it was not even faith on its own which healed the woman. The Bible says that power went out from him and healed her. She put her faith in the right person. Very soon, Jairus would experience an even greater miracle than that. But when Jesus stopped to speak to the woman, he could never have guessed it. So the darkest moment in his life became an opportunity to experience the grace and power of God. Sometimes it can be like that for us. Some people seem to have everything, and yet they're never really satisfied with life. We read about a man like that in the New Testament. Strangely enough, we don't know his name. But this young man really lived, and this event in his life is described in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. At the moment we meet this young man, he is running which for a rich and influential person like him was most unusual. What made him do this? He was born into a good Jewish family, religious and very wealthy. But this young man was seeking something more. He knew that one day he would be judged by God, and he wanted to know that eternal life would be his. He wanted to enter the kingdom of heaven. There was a preacher who talked about eternal life, a man who performed miracles of healing. His name was Jesus. The rich young ruler had never met Jesus, but he studied the Holy Scriptures and he tried to obey the Word of God. 
Not far away, they had brought children to Jesus that he might bless them. The disciples wanted to stop them, but Jesus said, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of heaven as a little child can never enter it. Jesus took the children in his arms and he blessed them. The rich young ruler heard that Jesus was in his area. This was his opportunity. It was not considered appropriate for a man like him to run, but eternal life was more important than what people thought about his dignity. Jesus would have the answer. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Gently, Jesus reminded him that no one can be good enough to earn eternal life. The young man was thinking about things he could do, rules he could keep. You know the commandments, said Jesus. You shall not commit adultery, or kill, or steal, and you shall give respect to your father and your mother. The young man had tried to obey the commandments all his life, but something was still missing and he knew it. What do I still lack? Go, said Jesus, sell what you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Sell everything? Give it all away? This was impossible. Surely Jesus must know that. But they had talked about the commandments, and both of them knew what the first commandment was. You shall have no other gods besides me. It was clear enough. This young man had broken the first commandment. Selling everything he had and giving the money to the poor would not in itself have given this young man eternal life. Of course not. But the command to do it showed him his real problem. He was enslaved by his riches. Obedience to God was less important to him than his own rich lifestyle. He could not receive the kingdom of God as a little child. He had to bring all his stuff with him, and he had so much stuff. So on this occasion, Jesus met with failure. Not his own failure, but the failure of the young man to respond. If the young man had responded to Jesus, if he had said, yes, today we might know his name. Now, this little incident faces us with a challenge. What comes first in my life? What takes absolute priority? If it is not God, then that is my God. So what shall I do? What should I do? In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, we read about a man named Nicodemus. Like many people, he listened to the words of Jesus, and he saw the miracles of healing which Jesus did. But to Nicodemus, there was something more. He believed these miracles were signs pointing to something, something bigger. But what? Nicodemus did not know what to think. He was a member of the Supreme Court and Council in Jerusalem, and most of his colleagues regarded Jesus of Nazareth as a threat. But Nicodemus was not so sure. He had heard about the teaching and power of Jesus, and he wanted to see for himself. For some time, Jesus had been preaching and teaching God's word, first in the Galilee region and then in Jerusalem. But Jesus did more than talk. There were amazing miracles of healing. Just by a touch or a word, the blind received their sight. The deaf were made to hear. The lame were enabled to walk. Even the prophets did not have a ministry like this. Who was this Jesus? There could be no doubt that God was using him and confirming his message by these miracles. 
But if Nicodemus wanted to know more, there was only one way to find out, face to face, alone. Uh, Rabbi, he said, we know you have come from God, for no one can do miracles like this unless God is with him. Truly, I say to you, unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What did Jesus mean by this? Uh, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he go into his mother's womb a second time and be born? I tell you the truth, said Jesus, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born from the flesh is flesh, and what is born from the Spirit is spirit. So do not be surprised about what I said to you. You must all be born again. The wind blows where it wants to, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. That's how it is for everyone who is born of the Spirit. How is this possible? Are you the teacher of Israel, said Jesus, and you don't understand these things? I am telling you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we give witness of what we have seen. But you people do not accept our witness. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you of the heavenly things? As Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that whoever believes should not perish, but through him have eternal life. Sometime later, it happened as Jesus said. He was lifted up on the cross. The council condemned his claim to be the Messiah, and the Romans executed him by crucifixion. Jesus was dead, the nails were removed, and the corpse was taken down. Nicodemus's friend, Joseph of Arimathea, wanted to put the body of Jesus in his own tomb. The Roman authorities gave their permission and released the body. Nicodemus came with a huge quantity of spices to anoint the corpse. It was far more than was needed and would cost him a fortune. But what did that matter? It was difficult to find the right words for a time like this. But he had to show his love for the great teacher. To do something. At least he could make sure that Jesus was buried in the proper way and his body left in peace. After Jesus had been lifted up on the cross, and after he had risen from the dead, if Nicodemus would put his faith totally in Jesus Christ, then he would be born again. What Jesus said to Nicodemus applies equally to you and me. If we want to see the kingdom of God, the Spirit of God must create within us a new life, a spiritual life. We must be born again.